The first one is actually passive solar because um, I also feel a bit sneaky about it because it's free and it works so well. But uh, we built the Earthship and there are many components to it that uh, make up the sustainability of it. But passive solar was one of them and it works beautifully in our home. We don't actually have auxiliary heat um, until about November and then we run a rocket mass heater until maybe the end of February and the sun does the rest of it. The other one actually is one that um, Chris introduced us to which is the uh, veggie oil that we use in our vehicles. We converted our diesel vehicles to run on waste vegetable oil which we collect from the A&W here in Barrier and we've been doing this for about four or five years. It's a little bit more work than just sitting back and enjoying the sun but it actually works very well for our family. Chris had to correct me on this when we first started because with the veggie oil I assumed that we were just making all sorts of inroads in saving our carbon footprint but it's actually carbon neutral so we're basically polluting the same amount but we're not taking fossil fuels to do it we're using a waste stream uh, we we actually drive less into Kamloops now than we used to our oldest daughter is in university so the things that she was doing in there aren't there anymore so but we do run around a bit and we have young drivers I'd have to say one of the persons I found most motivating um, in the last 10 to 15 years is a guy called Alvin Traub. And he lives just up the valley about 15 kilometers north of us. So he grew up in a farming family and he's logged and run a sawmill his whole life. And he has a grade eight education and he's one of the smartest guys I know. And he's probably one of the best engineers I know too. I've often thought that an actual education holds us back, right? Uh, he, mm -hmm. he approaches things from confidence that he can do whatever he sets his mind to and I often find that having been trained we often look at things as in terms of what we can't do so that's part of the reason I I find him so uh, noteworthy a person to, to try and emulate. Wow. I would say he's probably been my greatest mentor in that sense I've always been very conscious of our footprint uh, ever since I was pretty young and um, so I've always just thought in those terms. Probably um, trying to stay on the same page. Uh, a, yeah. lot of <laughs> a lot of our efforts have been conservation as well and uh, Chris about a year or so ago um, wrote a program and got some equipment so he could start monitoring our electrical use and uh, he started doing things like switching the hot water tank off at night and being able to monitor when the oven was on so he could try to reduce our energy consumption. But he, without telling us, he managed to do it remotely and he would call into the house when he was at work in Kamloops and he'd say, okay, who's, who's using the oven? <laughs> and he would forget or something would go wrong with the code and the hot water tank wouldn't come on in the morning and then we'd be having cold showers. <laughs> so it was, it's always a good idea Then we were always on board with that, but sometimes it didn't always equate to our sense of convenience or comfort. So there's a bit of loggerheads over that sometimes, but um, we've learned to just kind of go with it and our son Stephen learned how to override Chris's program anyway. Yes, there's that too. Yeah. So we managed to do work around some of it that way. We have very different focuses, right? I'm very technology oriented, like the house, the waste vegetable oil, whatever. And Sandra's it's the garden has been really her focus. And those are all really huge projects, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get spread too thin. I, I would say that's part of the push So we pull. grudgingly help each other with what we're interested <laughs> in. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> and your, your kids have almost grown up with this in progress, haven't they? Yes, yeah. They were quite young when we started building the airship. It created a few issues with our older daughter because she was 12 and she got it in her head that we were going to live in a heap of garbage because the whole thing with, with airships is the garbage warrior, the, the documentary of the fellow who came up with the idea. So we had to kind of explain that to her, but they got so blasé about what we were doing that I don't think they really realized until they were teenagers how different it was. And we homeschooled them for quite a while too. So, um, you know, people, especially as the kids got into their teens and they were more comfortable with the idea, they actually realized how different it was and how neat it was. And for the most part, they're okay with it, but the kids sometimes still um, don't like the notion that we're a little bit different than people. The irony is on a day-to-day -day basis they can get very frustrated mm -hmm. with wh whether it's me monitoring the power or living in the airship or whatever but when they go elsewhere and they describe it to friends or new acquaintances everybody thinks it's really cool. I'll bet. And then that's... But it's only cool they, when other people say it is, yes, not when they your like parents that. say it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So Sandra mentioned my pet project over the last little while has been monitoring 
hydro consumption. And last year we managed to drop it by 25% just by watching it really, honestly. And we, and we were low users. And this year I'm on track to do another 10% quite easily. And I think it's simple, right? Just reducing our consumption. And if I do it, it means nothing. But if all of Kamloops took that approach, it's a substantial change. And it, and it wasn't that hard, really. I mean, no. it, was, it was kind of, it was fun in some ways, but when our fridge died, our upright fridge, uh, we decided to buy a, a freezer and convert it to be our fridge, which is what you what you see over there. And the conversion cost fifteen dollars. Uh, I mean, the experience to do it, the knowledge. I mean, I don't know how much we would value that at, but we take it for granted. But um, that was probably part of our really big energy drop for the house. Cold air sinks, so every time you open the door on your upright fridge, particularly your freezer, you're dumping all your cold air out onto the ground. So with a chest freezer, uh, soon when you pop the lid open, your cold air is staying at the bottom of the, fr of the fridge. Okay. So that's the single biggest advantage to, to doing right. that. But even just turning your hot water off at night, you can put timers on almost anything in your house. Mm -hmm. And even the ability to monitor what's happening, I think, is very motivating. So if people actually invested in a system to monitor what they're using, being able to see that drop and, and equate it to your behaviors is quite powerful. Yeah, I, I worked for Ontario Hydro when I first graduated university. And when I started, this would have been... 91. 91. Uh, the whole concept of uh, instead of building additional generation, we reduce our consumption. That was just barely starting to come on the radar. The real attitude was just build more generating capacity. You know, it affects us all, right? It it, um, it all has an impact. The other one too that's that I think is really easy, but I've had no success convincing people. Um, when we first started doing this, I tried to talk to all my friends and say, "Look, we all own vans or cars. If we're going to shop, go for a big shop. Let's do it together." Because often in barrier, people go to Camelot's to do a big shop. Let's go all go in one vehicle. Let's shop. Let's let's come back and let's just you know mm. do it. For, uh, one of us hosts the the trip in and out, but. There's this thing, this culture around our vehicles that, um, number one, we like to have our own vehicles, and number two, we don't want to feel beholden to somebody else. There seems to be this keeping tabs of what we do for each other, and I think that held a lot of people back, but I think that's one of the easiest things to do, to be able to um, share resources just to reduce your yeah. consumption. The Camus Makerspace, we've been involved with that, and just um, the ability to use tools in a community, so you're not having to buy uh, a laser cutter would be a good example. Or uh, even to buy a tool that you, you'll only use once yeah. and then it, it's in your house forever. You know, the sharing of resources is huge, but again, that's been a harder one. I mean, in principle, it's easy, but I think har it's harder psychologically and well, culturally a, for us. It's yeah. a huge culture yeah. shift, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 When we first started building the Earthship, it was this new thing and we've always liked to do things that were different. With the Earthship, we'd hope to have lots of volunteers that we could help to learn about it because we were learning at the same time but I don't know if I've ever really thought about the impact on the community. I know it's often very easy when you start something like this to become very earnest about the things that you're you're trying to live and earnestness only goes so far and it often turns people off if you preach too hard about what you're doing. So I've always kind of gone under the assumption that we do what we believe is right, be happy about it, talk about it and hope to inspire people to do little things or big things. It's not a real yeah, we, set, in, uh, set goal about inspiring. We, we did, when we started the Earthship, we, we did make a conscious decision to blog about it. And we were pretty stunned by the response and really the size of the community that we generated. And to this day, even though we don't maintain the blog anymore, there are a lot of people looking requesting at the plans, information. requesting information, that but, kind of thing. But we were really the first Earthship builders in Canada yeah. to actually be public about what they were doing. It was the beginning of the whole blogging thing. We were the first ones to use Facebook. We really couldn't find information about these until we started asking people, and then we'd find phone numbers and we'd call up these people that had built them. Here in BC, there were about six or seven before us, but they were all built without permits, so people were naturally very quiet about it. So we were building with a permit, and so we were quite open about everything. And we just hit the right, we were the right kind of people in that we wanted to share everything. We were technology users, and it just was the right moment that everybody just, it just happened. But there have probably been 
20, 30, maybe 40 more Earthships since we started in 09. And people are using social media all the time now in yeah. their builds. It's, it's been quite, quite incredible. It's only really when we engage with the community, whether it's what we've done with the Earthship or getting involved with the BCSEA or getting involved with the Makerspace or what have mm -hmm. you. It's really the community that f I would say that feeds back to us, right? By getting involved in the community, we, we become more involved. Yeah, that's true because yeah. I became quite involved in the permaculture group in Kamloops and you know, those people have enriched things. They're interested in this, but they also help me with the garden and things like that. I mean, the Earthship is just a building. That's, it doesn't create it's a community. It's pretty cool area. though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris has a project that he started that, that I hope that he picks up again. When we look at our house, our single biggest use of energy consumption, because we've kind of solved the cars, we've mostly solved what we live in, but we still use electricity. That's the only, fuel that we bring into the house. We don't have propane we're not, we're or, not off -grid yet. or what have you, and we're not off-grid. And then if you look at our electricity consumption, 50% of that is domestic hot water, a family of five with three teenagers, and, and there's a lot of showers going on. There's a really fascinating project going on uh, out of Finland. It's called the um, Open Shower Project. There's a very common commercial product that captures the heat out of your wastewater stream. What they're aiming to do is actually recapture the water. So they're taking the water, filtering it, and pumping it back into the shower. And that means you're covering the heat and the water. So you save 90% of the water that you would mm -hmm. normally consume, and okay. then you save something similar in the, in the heat. Much um, like humanure, there's a bit of an ick factor to it. Because yes. people think, oh, all that dirty water that you've showered in is now going to go back into your bathroom stream or whatever. But there's purification methods. It's actually, there, it was a couple of university students, and it's very well researched. And then the other thought I have about that, I find that even with the vegetable oil cars, um, it always bothers me driving. And so I don't really know what the solution to that is, but batteries are certainly becoming more affordable. When we first started the Earthship, there were no Earthship mentors. We seem to do things, talk to people who think what we're doing is neat. Then we find out other people are doing things that are kind of neat and we talk to them. And you make all these connections, but it's almost like you're just meeting people who think as strangely as you do. Sometimes it feels like we're pretty weird. I would have to say that right now, the people that I look up to most are all the people who are doing these things that have come after us. Rather than looking to the past, I see all these young people coming up and they're, they're challenging the ideas that we've done. They're coming up with really neat ideas. So I would have to say that as much as many people would say that's kind of threatening, that that's very, very promising. Mm -hmm. And it's very invigorating for us to have, you know, these 20-somethings into the house who are talking about all these wonderful things. They inspire our kids. They, our kids think they're neat. And it just makes me very hopeful for what people are trying to do now. So all of that, and the guy who, had, who identified peak oil. <laughs> that's, that, that would be my... Your role model? My role model. All right. <laughs> True sustainability is boring. And I'm not sure if I'm paraphrasing that, and I can't remember who said it. But his point was, to be truly sustainable, you really want to be doing nothing. And, and so all, all of these things that we're doing, even to be sustainable, arguably we're just increasing our consumption in some ways, if you, it, in, if you look at it in a certain way. And so his argument is true sustainability is just the relaxed life like taking it easy and not not jumping not, on the hamster wheel and yeah, chasing chasing not, the things exactly yeah. like a no impact life like a no impact life i guess yeah you know for me we had a group of volunteers here in 2011 and they were discussing michael reynolds who was the guy who came up with the airship concept and there were purists in the group but how we should never deviate from his systems or his way of doing things and one of the volunteers who, who's actually become a good friend of ours, a guy named uh, James Hornett, he finally chimed up and he said, you know what, we should want to do better than Michael Reynolds because it means that we're doing better and things get better. We should always be looking to better those things. And it kind of silenced everyone, but it's true, right? It's, if we're always just satisfied with where we are, then nothing changes. Yeah, I thought it was that very insightful. blows my quote away. <laughs> That's our party wall. No, there you There's go. lots of bottles that we had to drink our way through <laughs> to get that wall. The idea developed in an area where there was no recycling, recycling for pop, pop cans. cans. So mm -hmm. it, yet again, it was a waste stream. So it made total sense to be using it. And what's interesting about it to me 
is the pop cans actually act as lap and you use lath and so the tab and the pop can so you normally you use lath and plaster to actually hold the um, plaster in place so the pop cans are, are performing that function as well and the bottles go right through the wall and so they when if you're everything else is off and you turn the lights on in the bathroom it's it's it quite lights up. it's quite pretty and it's an unfinished wall so very unfinished the, the actual pop cans will be covered but the uh the actual bottles will still be visible it's number mm. 643 on the list of things to do what are the walls made of the back walls of the house are tires 862 tires in the wall there's about 400 pounds of dirt in each tire what you're doing is creating this great big thermal mass at the back of your building particularly this time of year in the fall when you've got the sun's getting a little bit lower it's coming in and it's starting to strike the walls during the day heating them up and then as it cools off outside it starts to release that heat back out passively heating your home so what it means at this time of year when we go to bed at night it can be 20 degrees celsius inside it could be it could have dropped to six seven eight degrees outside if we close all the windows and doors then the heat comes out of the walls and it's uncomfortably hot, maybe 30 degrees in here by about 2 a.m. So even this time of year, we've got windows and doors open just to keep it at a nice 20. And Good that's so. the way it's supposed to work because in the winter, when it's much more cold outside, you want that heat releasing overnight to keep you you know, comfortable. And it, it works really well in our valley in particular. November, December, January are quite cloudy. So it doesn't work quite as well then, but we do have a rocket mass heater for those months, which uh, we use to heat the house otherwise. And these big windows here face south? They Absolutely, do. yep, to and do south. And we have opening windows at the bottom, skylights that open at the top, and so that gives us a natural air airflow when we have them all opened up. You'd call this passive solar, the fact that mm -hmm. it yes. warms up when yeah. the sun is low, yeah. And when the sun's higher in the summer, you don't get as much of that? You exactly. don't get as much. What we find is the front of the house can be quite warm, but it cools off. The windows are angled such that at uh, June 21st, which is when the sun is highest, it's only shining directly into what will be our indoor greenhouse. So the whole idea is that you don't get the direct sunlight in the rest of the house. Yeah. So you keep it coolish in the summer, and then in winter it actually strikes all the way to the back on December 21st. Mm -hmm. and you get as much warmth as you can. So. And so if our planters were actually planted in the summer, the plants would actually be bouncing some of the sun back so and, even and growing, right? We haven't done it yet, so. Okay, it's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting on our rocket mass heater. In the winter, this is a pretty popular place. If we come in from outside, the bench is always warm. The kids really like it. Uh, and in fact, if you stay on it too long, particularly where Cheryl is, it, it can get too hot. The rocket mass heater is based on technology that came out of development efforts in Africa. It started as just a rocket heater and they were trying to develop more efficient cook stoves. They wanted them to be able to build them out of parts and pieces that were locally available. So they came up with a design that used 45 gallon drums and dirt and rocks. It's a very efficient stove. This particular version of it works just like a masonry stove. The cook area on the top there where the fan is can get quite hot and you can actually boil water on it. The gases that are coming out and going up the uh, chimney first go through here and they bleed off a lot of their heat into the thermal mass. Once we light this up for the season and we're running it continuously, about eight hours a day, basically when we're awake, the bench is always warm. Unless the sun is shining, in which case it's far too hot to have this going. But the bench will still be warm. But the bench will still be yeah, warm. Absolutely. And there's about 10,000 pounds of clay, dirt, and straw with a bunch of rocks. It's, a, it's one of our more spectacular failures. When we put the final clear coat on it, as it heated up, it actually started to bleed. So it, it looks like it's got salt stains all along the front. The nice thing about it is you can always just chip the dirt chip off it away and, and, redo and, it. and redo it. And it's like all the things in this house, we elected to learn how to do things ourselves and just kind of dove in and did it. So we've had failures, but very few of them. And, you know, it's, it's made things interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>